Welcome everyone. As Margaret said, I'm Locke Ogans and it's my privilege to be the um, state director for the Virginia chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And we're just so thrilled to have all of you here today for this webinar. And our hope is that these webinars can be a bright spot in your day, especially uh, given the current tumultuous times that we're experiencing. And it's just great to see that we have over 100 people participating on this Zoom call today, as well as more on Facebook, Facebook Live. So thank you for joining us. And I just want to take a second and acknowledge our current and former trustees who are on the call. John Olfelder, Jill Harris, Galen Layfield, Pooja Seen, Ting Zhu, and Jeff Wright, as well as Brian Ball, Cliff Cutchins, and George Phillips, and any other trustees who phoned in from, a, from other states. It's just great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And now um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our presenters, Chris Bruce and Kate Wilkie. So I'm going to start with Chris. And Chris is the man who makes the maps. He is an award-winning photographer who's been with the Nature Conservancy for almost 19 years. Chris supports our work throughout Virginia and beyond, not only with maps, but also with spatial analysis, data collection, and data management. And he's worked to develop the first web mapping portal dedicated to marine spatial planning, which is what you're gonna hear more about today. So we're thrilled to have Chris with us. And then he is joined uh, by Kate Wilkie, who is our Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Scientist. Kate's been with the Conservancy for five years. She's just finishing her first year in a very important role serving as Virginia's representative on the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, which is a prestigious appointment that she was given by the governor and the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. Prior to coming to TNC, Kate worked in commercial fisheries in the Gulf of Maine, in Newfoundland, and in Baja, Mexico. So you've got two real experts who will be presenting today. And with that, I want to hand it over to Kate, who will lead off. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Locke. Um, I assume you all can hear me and see my screen OK. Um, so as Locke said, my name is Kate Wilkie. I'm a fishery scientist. Uh, that means I study fish populations in the ocean, how they interact with one another and their habitats, and then the effect of fishing on those fish and their habitats. I use science to set rules for safe fishing so that commercial harvest and recreational fishing for fun doesn't harm fish populations and other marine life. The Nature Conservancy is the, the world's largest conservation organization, and you can't really claim to protect the land and water on which all life depends without spending some energy thinking about the ocean, which covers 70% of the planet. So the Virginia chapter of the Nature Conservancy launched its first marine conservation plan in 2006. Our ocean work is much newer than our land conservation. Uh, the, so this map shows the, the waters off the coast of Virginia are part of the mid-Atlantic seascape. And that region goes from roughly Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, to Long Island, New York. And the, the fish and fishermen off of Virginia don't pay all that much attention to state boundaries. And so I, you're going to hear me talk a lot about the mid-Atlantic or the mid-Atlantic seascape because the, the scale of, of this ocean work is bigger than just off the coast of Virginia. Uh, so this region of the ocean, the, these little yellow areas on the map are, are deep water canyons, um, which have a lot of unique ecological diversity. And the whole mid-Atlantic seascape is an extremely ecologically productive area. It's where the cool waters from the Labrador Current come down and meet up with the Gulf Stream that comes up from the south and marine mammals and several species of migratory fish and sea turtles follow that jet stream and migrate up the coast. Skip ahead. Um, so all this ecological productivity supports commercial fishermen, which supply seafood to our nation, and also supports a uh, very extensive recreational fishing 
industry and all the support businesses that go along with that. So there's charter boat captains who take anglers out to catch straight bass, black sea bass, summer flounder, tuna, all kinds of different fish. And then all the marine manufacturers and, and um, bait and tackle shops and restaurants that support that um, recreational activity. Um, so on top of all this ecological productivity uh, in the mid-Atlantic seascape, uh, this area is also home to the nation's largest population centers, Philadelphia, New York City, Virginia Beach, uh, and all the associated human activity that goes with with these huge population centers. So container freight shipping, um, naval activity, sand mining to renourish beaches, and all their recreation and tourism activities that, that are so important to this region. So 59% of Virginia's population lives along the coast. That's 4.9 million people out of a total population of about 8.3 million. And coastal Virginia employs over 2.2 million people per year. And those people earn a total of almost 132 billion in wages. And then thinking about commercial fisheries in the mid-Atlantic, uh, 751 million pounds of seafood are harvested worth $600 million. So just some numbers for those of you who like numbers. <laughs> Uh, in the last few years, a new industry is really booming off the shores of Virginia and much of the Atlantic coast, and that's offshore wind energy development. The U.S. is in urgent need of more sources of renewable energy, and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which is part of the Department of the Interior, has laid out a plan to lease millions of acres of ocean for, for wind development. And there's no doubt that this needs to happen because we urgently, as a, as a society and a human population, need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But in, in developing new sources of renewable energy, we need to make sure it's done with careful planning and consideration for marine life and habitats. The scale of development is gonna be huge. This map here shows the lease areas from well, and even now there's more plans to go up into the Gulf of Maine, and this map uh, cuts off at, at Cape Hatteras, but these are the wind energy leases on the Atlantic coast going down to South Carolina. And the scale of development is really going to be huge. Think planning of the U.S. interstate highway system in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, these, each of these wind energy areas could proceed individually, but if carefully planned from a large scale, there's much to be gained from an efficiency perspective and in minimizing environmental impact. So this sector is expanding really quickly and TNC is, is getting organized and um, starting to engage at the federal and state levels and also with developers um, to advise and encourage best management practices. Oh, my slides changed automatically. Um, so it's, it's really important for the Nature Conservancy to be involved, I think. Um, there's a lot of cheerleaders out there for renewable sources of energy. Um, but what I think our, our niche is, is for us to be a strong voice for avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating potential negative environmental impacts of development. So I would say offshore wind development is one of the two biggest challenges that facing our ocean today. And so the second biggest challenge is climate change. And this map shows how, how average sea surface temperature around the world has changed between 1901 and 2015. The mid-Atlantic has warmed two to four degrees in the last 30 years and a two degrees two degree change in water temperature is a lot more dramatic than a two degree change in air temperature. Um, and the oceans play a huge role in making climate change better for people. So the, the, the air temperature and environment would be a lot, lot hotter if we didn't have the oceans, um, which are absorbing two thirds of emitted carbon dioxide and 93% of the Earth's extra heat. 
But this service that the oceans are providing comes at a price and it means oceans are warming, becoming more acidic, they have less oxygen and are becoming stratified. So you're not having the mixing of the nutrient rich, deep cold waters um, that support all the sea life and, and production in the ocean. So in the mid-Atlantic, we're observing um, effects of climate change on the ecosystem. There's changes in the large ocean currents. Um, the Gulf Stream is shifting more to the north and, and that controls our weather. Um, the Labrador Current, <clears throat> this, the cold water from the Labrador, Labrador Current hasn't been coming down in 2017, 18, and 19 the way that it normally does. There's more warm core rings spinning off of the Gulf Stream. Um, we're also seeing changes in features that are normally part of our ocean environment, like a cold pool off of Long Island, that's warming. Bottom temperatures are increasing. Um, we're seeing heat waves in the water. So prolonged heat, um, is, it's affecting primary productivity, which is the timing and location of plankton blooms in the water. So those plankton blooms support all life in the ocean. And many fish species time their reproduction through evolutionary processes with the timing and location of those plankton blooms. And so it, it's, it's really the, the earth and the ocean's cycles and systems are all attuned to one another. And so when things start changing more dramatically than over a really long time period, then those, everything, the systems get out of whack and uh, it really threatens the whole functioning of the ecosystem. So let's see, I just spent some time painting a broad picture of how climate change is affecting the ocean in our backyard. And that changing environment is affect, affecting fish species and fisheries as well. And when I say fisheries, meaning how and where people catch fish for either commercial or recreational purposes. Um, <clears throat> So there, according to the Peterson Field Guide for Atlantic Coast Fish, there's more than 1,100 species of fish uh, that swim in our Atlantic coastal waters between Canada and, Canada and the Gulf of Mexico. This is more than twice the number of bird species in the eastern North, North America, or three times the number of butterflies. There's always a little bit of competition between fish people and bird, bird people, so just have to throw that statistic in there. Um, fish can be predatory hunters like bluefish, which attack, attack and eat anything they can swallow, or graceful swimmers that glide over the sandy bottom like the Kaunos ray. Many conservation organizations publicize the dire plight of marine mammals, whales, and dolphins. Um, but these fishes that share the same environment are no less valuable from an ecological or, or an evolutionary perspective and so they can give us clues to to changes that are happening in the ocean um the ocean degrading due to pollution overfishing or exploitation so most fish are extremely sensitive to ocean temperature and they can survive only in a specific temperature range. And I think I shouldn't have switched, yeah. But these changing ocean conditions um, impact every species a little bit differently. And some fish seek out cooler waters, swimming deeper or farther north when they can. But it's not just about fish moving um, and changing habitats when the water gets warm. It's actually their reproductive success and the overall health and fitness of populations of fish and everything in the ocean are, are impacted. And a recent study from the National Academy of Sciences reports that the total mass of sea animals is projected to drop by 5% for every 1.8 degree of ocean warming. 
So because of the immense pressures from human activity and all the challenges associated with the changing climate, the Nature Conservancy has prioritized working on the ocean and, and trying to make a more healthy ocean. And we work in Virginia and we also work in all of our, our state chapters along the coast, as well as at the national level, implementing federal policy to improve ocean health. And that's one of the strengths of the Nature Conservancy is that we do have chapters in every state we work together on these issues and we work to scale up our, our results to affect national policy. Um, <clears throat> so in order to be successful, we work with all kinds of different partners at scales from local communities to, um, to the national uh, stage. And in Virginia, some of the specific work we're focusing on is to strengthen and protect the small fish that make up the base of the food web that feeds all marine life. This is important in Virginia, um, particularly, because there's a little fish called Menhaden uh, that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, and it's the target of the biggest fishery on the East Coast, and it's extremely important in our ecosystem. And that's a whole other talk that I could give on another day, um, but please ask us if you're interested in that work. Um, we, we also are, are working to implement environmentally compatible offshore wind, uh, and we're working to protect important habitats. Um, so that's just a little sampling of our work. And I want to turn the floor over now to my colleague, Chris Bruce, to talk about one piece of our habitat protection work. And this is just an example of some of the details of how we work and, and the, the results that we uh, come up with. And so in order to protect ha important habitats, we first have to figure out what characteristics of the ocean define important or productive habitat. And that's definitely a challenge underwater and in a habitat that's moving constantly. Um, so Chris's work is helping us to identify important habitat areas by tracking where fish are persistently abundant over time, meaning areas where there's lots of fish even as the ocean changes over decades. So, Chris, let me stop sharing so you can take over. All right, thank you, Kate. Uh, so, I'm going to, uh, as Kate said, talk about a specific project that I've worked on recently. Uh, before I do that, I'll just give you a general background of what we're looking at here. This is just one of many tools that we're using uh, as we engage around trying to build and sustain a healthy ocean. Uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal, portal.midatlanticocean.org. We'll have the link available uh, in the chat in just a bit, I think, uh, and um, it's sent out afterwards as well. But this is a free and open uh, data portal. Anybody with an internet connection and a web browser can come here and view these data. And uh, this portal now, uh, I was just uh, looking back at some of my early work on this uh, this morning. Uh, it, it's about to celebrate its 10 year anniversary. So this started in 2010. Uh, it was built primarily by the Nature Conservancy uh, with a number of partners. Uh, and the first version of this portal was on a TNC server. Uh, and it has come a long way since then. It's managed by a consortium of partners partners now. Uh, that first version of the portal contained 32 data layers. Uh, we are up into several thousand data layers uh, uh, that are available now. Uh, and this is important because uh, a lot of these data layers come from uh, state or federal agencies that are doing ocean management. And oftentimes in the past, these agencies were sort of managing in silos, the, the fisheries people had fisheries data, the Coast Guard had data on shipping uh, and so forth. Uh, and what we're doing here with this data portal is bringing all of that data, anything that's related to the ocean and ocean planning um, all together. Uh, and what you're seeing here uh, is what a lot of maps that I make might look like if they're um, on topics about terrestrial work we're doing, uh, where the ocean is blue, uh, and that's about it. Uh, or maybe 
you have uh, this ocean base map here where you see a little bit about what's going on in the ocean bottom. But in fact, uh, the ocean is a very busy place and I'll give you just a very small sampling here of the types of data that we have available on this portal. Um, so here we're looking at recreational uses uh, around Virginia Beach. Uh, these are people who are doing wildlife and sightseeing activities and, and this particular data set uh, is what you might call crowdsourced, uh, just collected from people who are engaging in these activities. Uh, there are a lot of artificial reefs offshore. We have those mapped throughout the mid-Atlantic, important for people who are diving or fishing or what have you. Uh, we have a lot of ecological data. So here's just one example of uh, a certain group of bird species that are uh, using the offshore area. Um, and I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see more of this. Um, as Kate mentioned, renewable energy. There's a, a huge interest in renewable energy. So what I just pulled up are all of the uh, active renewable energy lease areas, uh, and there's uh, some large areas um, around the Hudson Canyon off of New York as well. We have in Hampton Roads the largest military base in the world, and of course the, the military uh, has a lot of data that uh, we are not able to put on a public portal, but there are some security related data layers as well on there, for example, danger zones and restricted areas. Uh, we have a lot of data on fishing and of course uh, there's a lot of ship traffic as well so any uh, place that's colored in in the darker blue or these brighter colors uh, on the map uh, that's a ship track from 2019. Uh, so as you start to layering on all of these uh, different data sources uh, you quickly realize that the ocean is in fact a very busy place. Um, so I'll get now to the specific project that uh, we've been working on recently, which is looking at how uh, fish species are moving. So if you go to this portal and look under the marine life theme and look at fish species through time, there's a number of species here that uh, you can look at. And we'll look first at uh, one particular species, uh, black sea bass, it's important uh, commercial and recreational species in the mid-Atlantic. And we'll give that a few seconds to load. All right, this is a perfect time for uh, my internet to be wonky. There we go, we're getting there. Apologies for the delay on this. Let's try looking at summer flounder instead. All right, apologies for the technical difficulties here, folks. There we go. Uh, okay, so uh, what we're looking at here, we flip over to our legend and uh, we're looking at uh, black sea bass currently. And this is, uh, uh, we've visualized this by decade and by various thresholds of biomass. So the, the darkest green is the highest biomass area for the species. And uh, we can toggle through uh, and see how that is changing over time. And apologies again, we seem to be wanting to switch over to summer flounder. All right, so let's see if we can get the black sea bass back now. There we go. We can play an animation here uh, to look uh, just in a, a little uh, quick animation of how this species is moving around and changing through time. And what you can see here is kind of a northward shift in this case. Uh, if we just want to toggle back between the 1970s and current, uh, you can see that uh, there's definitely more presence of this species and the, the larger area of this dark green blob here just means that this fish is expanding its range, doesn't necessarily mean that there's more of them. 
uh, but we can toggle back and forth between seasons too because oftentimes fish will uh, be in different places at different times of the year. So uh, we'll look at one more species here, see if we can get that uh, summer flounder back up. There we go. It's behaving better now, thank you. Uh, so again, we can toggle back and forth from uh, over 50 years of data, these five decades that we have visualized here. And uh, again, in this case, you can see a, a northward shift. Now, not all species are moving around like this. Some tend to stay in a very confined space. Uh, and also the data that we're using here uh, don't say anything by themselves about what's causing these movements, but uh, we do know from a lot of other research that's going on that, that climate change is certainly affecting how these fish are moving around. And this is important um, because if you're fishing off the coast of Virginia, uh, maybe back in the 70s or 80s, uh, you had uh, plenty of these fish uh, right uh, off the coast of Virginia or even down south into North Carolina. And in present day, well, they're still there, but um, the bulk of that biomass has moved northward. And so uh, you need to travel potentially uh, much farther to catch the same fish. So we'll just take a look at one more thing here. Um, if my connection will cooperate, uh, and that is future projections. Um, so what we've done uh, that I've just been talking about is based on historic actual data. And there is also a group out of Rutgers University that is taking those same uh, historic data and then uh, applying climate models and other information to project how things might change into the future. Uh, and while we can't compare those two data sets directly, uh, we can still get a general idea of changes that might be happening. So in the case of summer flounder, again, what we have here is an animation that's just looking in 20 year increments uh, and going out to the year 2100. And, and what you're seeing here is that this fish is expected to um, be much more relatively abundant uh, up into uh, off of New York and in the sort of northern part of the mid-Atlantic over time. So uh, I'll turn it back to Kate to talk a little bit more about the implications of this and, and where we are going from here. Um, just another view of the portal here real quick. Um, we also have a data on fishing activity, uh, and that's what you're seeing here, um, looking specifically at bottom trawl data, um, and these are the types of vessels that are often catching the species that we looked at, uh, and then of course the wind energy is the, the big issue as well. Uh, so Kate, back to you to wrap us up. Thanks, Chris. Um, I mean, it might not be apparent to folks who don't make their living from the ocean or who don't spend tons of time out saltwater fishing, but these sh shipping distributions are causing major problems for coastal communities that rely on stable ocean conditions. Um, so, for example, all these black sea bass are showing up off of Long Island and farther north than they have been in the past, and I hear stories that fishermen can't avoid them. And, and that wouldn't be a problem, except for they don't have permits or quota to catch the fish. So they're ending up having to throw back perfectly good fish um, as discards, uh, which may or may not survive. And that is not an ideal situation. Um, and as Chris said, fishermen that have traditionally relied on certain species are, are sometimes finding they have to travel farther and farther in increasing their costs um, to actually catch the fish. So um, there's a lot of management um, solutions that, that you can come up with. Flexibility in permitting, diverse fishing portfolios can help. Um, but so through my work on the council, Locke mentioned that I was appointed to the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. It's a pretty prestigious appointment, which I was really excited um, to do. I've been with the council for almost a year now, 
and uh, this term will be two more years with the possibility of, of potentially um, having two more terms to follow. So it's um, a really uh, good enabling condition for me to have this uh, seat on the council to expand the work that we do and, and help with um, some some challenges relating to fishing, fishing and ocean conservation. And um, so one, one of the, our newest initiatives that we're just in the very beginning stages of is we're planning on leading a, uh, it's a climate change scenario planning strategy. So working with the council and other federal ocean managers to think through different scenarios of, of changes that will happen in the ocean relating to climate change and think about how does that affect ocean management and what decisions can we make as managers today that won't handcuff us in the future or that will set us up for success better in the future. So it's it's kind of can be wonky um, that example but that's one of the specific ways that we're working to improve ocean conservation. Um, so this project that Chris talked about today and some of the habitat conservation um, and, and kind of general uh, things that I've told you that we're working on for ocean conservation, it, it's just a sampling of, of how TNC is working toward a more healthy ocean. And it's part of a larger, more comprehensive plan to ad address the major threats and improve the way that humans use the ocean without using it up. Um, so I think that we should stop now and let you guys ask us some questions and uh, hopefully we can answer them. Awesome. Awesome presentation. Thank you, you guys. You don't need me to tell you that. But anyway, we have indeed been having some questions submitted throughout your, uh, throughout your talk. And some of you who have submitted questions through the Q&A may find that they're being answered um, right there in that Q&A box. My partner in question fielding is none other than the state chapter's senior conservation scientist, Judy Dunscombe. And so she's, uh, she's been fielding some questions there and typing responses to you and, uh, and then passing others along to me. And as I said, we'll get to as many as we possibly can. And if we are unable to answer all of your questions during this period, know that they, there will be a follow-up and they will be answered. You can continue to ask them during the Q&A period by using the Q&A function. So let's see, this first one is gonna be for both of y'all. So I think it's a good one for, um, for Chris to start with and maybe hand to Kate, but I'm not telling you how to do your jobs. So the question is, for how many species of fish do we have data in the portal and is there a lot left to know? Well, certainly there is a lot left to know. Um, the, the short answer to that question is there are about uh, 82 species, I believe, uh, that are uh, available. Um, and we have various data about those in the portal. Uh, the specific project that I was working on focused really on sort of the most important uh, species for the mid-Atlantic and there were 14 species that we looked at there. And I'll just follow up and say there's more species that are we have better data um, to do this kind of analysis. Uh, this comes from the NOAA trawl survey um, program and so fish that are not caught in that trawl survey we don't have as good of an idea as, um, as to how you know how they are if and how their distributions are changing over time. Great, thank you. Okay, Chris, I've got another one for you. Does portal.midAtlanticOcean.org exist for ocean GIS data for oceans around the world beyond the Mid-Atlantic? It does not. Uh, there are many other uh, similar portals that have ocean-related data. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic uh, and the Northeast also has a portal. Um, there's a, a series of regional uh, ocean management bodies uh, throughout the U.S., but those two really have the most um, well-developed and active data portals. Uh, so really, we're just talking about the area roughly from North Carolina or Virginia uh, up uh, through Maine. 
Um, there is, um, I believe, a portal uh, for the West Coast as well, but then there's also uh, something called the Marine Cadaster, which is a NOAA product uh, that contains a lot of the same data and also uh, national scale data sets. Great, thank you. Okay, these next couple looks like are gonna be for Kate. Um, Kate, Jen, who interacts with the general public and is interested in making some of this information relatable, would like to know, to gain a better understanding of ocean temperature change, is there an air equivalent to two to four degrees? An air equivalent. Um, well, yes, there is, and I can't think of it right off the top of my head, but I, so it takes a lot more energy to warm water um, by one degree than it does to warm the air by one degree. So, I mean, when I say one degree in the ocean, it's still one, one degree of temperature difference, but um, I, don't, I don't know if that helps, but yeah, it's kind of, I, I, I don't, I think I could look up the, the exact um, difference, but I don't have it off the top of my head. Well, I think that's probably a good start. And uh, Jen, if you'd like more information on that, you know, feel free to either follow up with us afterwards or apply to the follow-up email too. We get you more details. That's great. Thank you. As, a, as an interpreter with the public, I love that kind of stuff. Um, okay, Kate, is the Nature Conservancy involved in studying Manhattan populations in the Chesapeake Bay? And if the current reduced catch limits imposed on the Omega Corporation will be monitored, and if so, by whom? Okay, so um, yes, we do pay attention to the Manhattan catch in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, we, I, I work at the ASMFC level, that is the management body that is in charge of managing Manhattan on a coastwide basis which includes setting the total allowable catch for the state of Virginia and the Chesapeake Bay. So the, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is a joint body of 15 states who come together and decide on the rules uh, because Atlantic Menhaden is a fish that is found from Maine to Florida. Um, so the catches that happen off of Virginia affect other states um, and so that's why it's important to manage together. Um, the, the ASMFC sets the Chesapeake Bay cap um, and through Amendment 3 that was reduced. Um, that did not impact the total fish that Virginia was allowed to catch. And in fact, Virginia was allowed to catch more fish under Amendment 3 than they had previously. Um, <clears throat> management does not deal with, it, we don't assess how many fish are in Chesapeake Bay separately from the coastwide assessment. So it would be really great to have a Chesapeake Bay specific Menhaden survey. And there are some scientists, I think at the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, who are working on that type of study. Um, and they've come up with a design and eventually it will need to be funded. So, um, Margaret, am I missing a part of the question? Oh, who will, who will enforce? Can you read the second part again? Yes, absolutely, Kate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 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 if the current reduced catch limits imposed on the Omega Corporation will be monitored, by whom will they be monitored? Okay, yeah. Um, so, fishermen have to report their catches um, to the state, and then that is passed along to NOAA fisheries. Um, and so the catch is monitored and um, there's also enforcement on the water, um, but, but it's, it's monitored by the, the agencies that manage fisheries and, and at the end of the year after they total up all the data, you know, we know how much is being caught. Um, and, and, Usually that data is private. If, if it's not, um, data from one company is private. So you can put it together with three or more people or companies and then release, release the data publicly, publicly. But if it's just the data of one company, that is private. But the fisheries managers can see all that. 
Great, thank you. All right. Let's see, what effect does acidification have on ocean CO2 absorption? Ooh, I don't know if I want to answer that one right now. <laughs> That's um, ocean chemistry, and I am not a physical oceanographer, um, so I don't think I'm going to pretend to know the answer to that one off the top of my head. Like the most solid response you can possibly give, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. I'm, I'm not totally positive. Okay, well, this may uh, throw you for another loop. What percentage of oxygen is produced from oceans via photosynthesis, if you know? The top of oh, head. well, I just happen to have an answer to that one. Actually, Judy answered that question very well in the chat. So 50, per, 50 to 80 percent of oxygen comes from the ocean, from so photosynthesis, from um, plankton and algae. Awesome. That falls solidly in the go team category, doesn't it? It's <laughs> great. Okay. Are there any promising technologies? This is, this is a two-parter here, so I'll read it all and then let me know what you want me to do. Are there any promising technologies that can be applied to commercial fishing and fisheries to reduce habitat disruption from bottom trawling? Are there financial incentives that can help commercial fishermen be better equipped to further limit bycatch and other environmental issues while improving the economic plight of fishermen? Okay, there's a lot there. Um, I mean, so that's one of the ways that the Nature Conservancy works on fisheries is to do it collaborative, collaboratively with fishermen. Um, to, to come up with gear technologies that do reduce environmental impact. So, um, and, and there is a <laughs> trawl advisory panel that's, that's a group of fishermen that works through the councils and they work on developing that sort of technology. Um, so off the top, top of my head, I can't rattle off, you know, a certain technology that, that I can point you to. But um, there is a lot more to learn in that um, category, too. So, you know, there, there's ongoing research all the time on how to improve efficiency in, in fishing and do less environmental damage. Um, I, I, I don't know if I kind of got the second part of that question in there, or do you want to repeat that, Margaret? I would be happy to repeat it, just in case. Are there financial incentives that can help commercial fishermen be better equipped to further limit bycatch and other environmental issues whilst improving the economic plight of the fishermen? Well, I mean, certainly if, if you're spending your time catching a bunch of fish that you can't use or sell, um, that is not, financial incentive. So it, it behooves a fisherman to really target the, the species that they're wanting to target and that they can, um, you know, sell for, for profit. Um, and also NOAA has um, funding programs to develop gear and technology to reduce bycatch. Um, so folks can come up with a project idea and, and submit a proposal to get some of that funding as well. Great, thank you. Okay, this one, I think this could go for either one of y'all, so I'm gonna let you fight over it a little bit. We'll have some competition. Um, there's a lot of sport fishing in the bays and inshore ocean area. Do you have data at a more detailed scale for this area and particularly picking up the movement of species such as summer flounder into and out of the bays in the summer. The fish population also seems to be migrating towards the shore. Is that just coincidental? So I'll start with that and, and Kate, uh, you probably have some thoughts as well. Um, we don't have a lot of good data, particularly not on the Mid-Atlantic Ocean data portal for species that um, are moving inshore uh, or you know closer to shore or in the base and so forth. Much of the data that, that we have on the portal uh, comes from federal uh, agencies and they are mostly doing this sampling in federal waters, which is three miles offshore or further out. 
uh, individual states do their own um, surveys, but it's a, a challenge uh, that we have yet to um, crack to stitch all of those various state surveys together uh, because they are all done with different methodologies and so forth. Um, so that's definitely an area where there's room for improvement. Uh, in terms of fish um, moving closer to shore or further offshore, um, there's, um, that's, that's not good or bad by itself. Um, what you mo more often see is a seasonal migration. Um, so fish will be closer to shore in one season and further offshore uh, in another season. Uh, Kate, uh, any other thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I think these, uh, the question specifically mentioned um, sport fishing too. So another piece of data collection that I'm really interested in pursuing, and I think a lot of people on the coast are, is um, Chris mentioned state trawl surveys. And those can target certain types of fish better than other types. Um, but there is so much recreational fishing that goes on in this, in the mid-Atlantic and off Virginia. Um, and, and we need to get a better handle on what people are catching and what they're throwing back. Um, and so it's the hope that uh, through cell phone apps and fishermen reporting their catch data, um, that that could improve some of the information that we have for management. The real challenge with that is gonna be how, if, if we can collect data through cell phones, which you know, we're getting really good at that uh, in our society these days. Um, the challenge will be how to actually use that data for stock assessments and management. So we just got to get the statisticians and the fishery scientists to figure out how to tweak all that data and, and actually use it for our management. Great, thank you. Okay, let's see. Got a couple that that are thinking a little bit about bird activity. Does the Marco data include seabirds and their food supplies? So it does. Uh, we do have a lot of data on the portal uh, relative to seabirds. Uh, in terms of um, making the a, a specific connection with food supplies, uh, there's still a lot more work to be done on that front, I think. But um, we've got a, a lot of bird data and a lot of fish data. Uh, so that's uh, definitely an area for um, further work. Okay, excellent. And um, so, you know, we worry about birds and physical wind equipment. Is this the case for fish too with offshore wind? Uh, yeah, we're, we're certainly, um, worried about um, offshore wind development and potential impacts on fish. Um, there's, there's a lot we don't know. And so some of the potential threats are electromagnetic frequency, EMF, uh, that frequencies that come from buried cables and um, some fish and, and sharks in particular, sharks and rays or the elasmobranchs um, are fish that actually navigate and find their food with electromagnetic pulses. Um, they have little organ pits on the tops of their foreheads and on their bodies that detect those frequencies. And so, um, you know, it's, we don't know a lot, but there have been very recent scientific papers that do show that those frequencies can inhibit their migration or finding of food. So there's that. And then there's uh, increased boat traffic that will be associated with construction. Um, and boats are a major source of, of noise in the ocean. Um, and so with increased boat traffic, that means increased noise. There's also noise um, from the actual construction activities and pile driving. Um, and fish, you know, a lot of people worry about marine mammals and, and how sound affects them. And that is certainly um, 
a concern. But relating to fish, we, we know less. And uh, some fish, I think the most concerning thing for me is uh, some fish use sound for mating behavior and to group together in spawning aggregations, big groups of fish that are all going to release their eggs at the same time. And um, if they are using sound to communicate with one another to coordinate that reproductive activity uh, and, and anthropogenic noise, noise caused by humans um, interferes with their ability to communicate um, and gather and reproduce. That's going to have big population level effects um, rather than just affecting a few individual fish that, you know, might have uh, been stunned because they were exposed to extreme pile driving right in their near vicinity. So, um, and the other thing is fish can, um, fish absorb sound through, kind of use their swim bladders and not exactly, but that organ in a fish, a swim bladder fills up with the air and they can control their buoyancy. And so loud noise in the ocean can affect that too and um, have, have harmful effects. On the flip side, um, more structure in the water for structure loving fish, you know, that provides a lot of nooks and crannies um, for, for fish to hide in and um, have protection. So for some structure loving fish, more structure in the water might not be a bad thing. So there's a lot to learn. Um, and actually we have a really fantastic opportunity off of the coast of Virginia. Um, just this summer, they put the very first two turbines in the water, in federal waters in the whole US, right off of Virginia. And so the, the, these two are meant to be a pilot project where we can, learn from all of the effects of construction and and um, the impact that these turbines are having. Um, and so we need, the Nature Conservancy is very interested in making sure that that Dominion and Boehm and the state of Virginia are asking the right kinds of scientific questions and then monitoring the effects of this construction and operation of these turbines. So, so we can learn when for the commercial size project that's going to put in, I don't remember if it's 80 turbines or anyway, many, many more turbines will be installed for the big commercial projects. So we want to learn from um, installation of the first turbines. And then within Virginia, we are going to be setting the precedent for how wind is developed in all of those wind energy areas that were shown on that map along the coast. So we have a real opportunity here if, if we can do things right or learn from, um, you know, mistakes or just learn to do things better than, than we can be an example. That was a long winded answer, but I wanted to use that opportunity to, to kind of talk about the, the opportunity we have here in Virginia. It's just fascinating, Kate, and that's what people are here to hear about. I wish this was a two-hour session. <laughs> I think probably everybody does. So we've got one more question um, for this particular session. There are some others that were still in the pipeline, so don't worry. They will be answered during our follow-up, but our, um, our final question for our live session today is, we've, we've been talking about offshore wind here. Can you give us an idea of how TNC is helping with low-impact development of offshore wind? Yeah, so I, I kind of just talked a little bit about that, but I'll, I'll go a little further and say, you know, it's, it's pretty cool because Chris just showed you this ocean data portal and the Nature Conservancy really was, um, you know, a instrumental partner in, with lots of other folks, but in, in the original development of that tool. And so that tool is now and I, I would say in the beginning, I think there was resistance for the development of it and, and really trying to encourage folks to use it. And I would say now uh, it's kind of ingrained in the, in the way that we think about ocean management and people think right away, oh, well, let me go to the portal to look that up. So that's, I think, a real success 
But as far as um, in, in the planning stages of offshore wind development, I know that the portal has been used to kind of identify sites and, and identify um, uh, other ocean uses that are either compatible or incompatible with ocean with wind development in certain areas. Uh, but now is the time to, we need to move beyond the data that's actually available in the portal and get more specific, drill down um, to finer scale. And, um, and so now the challenge will be to really, um, you know, think about what are the potential impacts of offshore wind development, construction and operations and make sure that we monitor and mitigate um, any, any impacts that happen. And so, like I was saying in Virginia, we have a real opportunity to really learn from these first two turbines and set the, set the example um, for other development along the coast. That's great. Thanks so much for uh, following up with that extra info there. And again, we will respond to any lingering questions after the fact and get the information out to y'all. Thank you for your participation. And now I'll hand it back to Locke to send us on our way. Y'all take care and thanks again for joining us. Oh, thank you, Margaret. And thank you so much, Kate and uh, Chris. And I just thank everybody who was on the call with us today. Um, we're really happy to have you join us and we really appreciate your great questions uh, and your interest in our work. And I just want to say to conclude that Kate and Chris are just fantastic examples of the extraordinary team that is working on the ground and in the sea here in Virginia uh, and really across the conservancy. And I hope that you can see that their work really matters not only for, for nature, but also for all of us who depend on nature and that we all need to thrive by taking care of each other. And so um, I wanna thank you all also for your support because I know many of you on the call have provided support that makes the work of people like Kate and Chris possible. And uh, for that, we are very, very grateful and just wanna say thank you. And then finally, this webinar is part of the series. So be on the lookout for an invitation to our next one, which should be coming out next month. And until then, please stay well and safe. And thank you so much again for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it and we hope you enjoyed your time together. Take care and be safe. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for joining.